So we are going to be moving on to the A2 part here. And the A2 part is from chapter one. And it's about just by proof by contradiction. So it's really worth remembering that you've got proof by deduction, proof by exhaustion, and sometimes you can do disproof questions as well. But we're going to spend today's lesson looking at proof by contradiction. And the kinds of things that we use that for will be like proving that the square root of 2 is irrational. So this is the theory of how we do proof by contradiction. And I would say this is the most important part of the whole lesson that we've got here. So it says that to prove a statement is true by contradiction, first of all, you assume that the statement is in fact false. You do the opposite of what you'd expect to be true. You then prove that this would lead to a contradiction. I'm going to explain what this means in a second. And because there's a contradiction, that means that we were wrong in assuming that the statement was false. So the reverse of that must be true. And in fact, the statement must be true. So I'm just going to say that in some other ways of how we might write this. What we're going to do is we are going to assume that the negation or the opposite of the statement is the thing which is true. So I'm just rewriting this in a slightly different way because it might help you understand it. So here I've said assume that the statement is false. That's the same thing as that assuming that the opposite of the statement is true. And I'm going to put it in true like this because we know it's not true. We're just uh, pretending that it's true. That's what the first bullet point is saying. The second bullet point is said, I proved that this would lead to a contradiction. A contradiction means something goes wrong or doesn't work. Okay. And because something goes wrong or doesn't work, this means our assumption was wrong. And we assumed that the opposite thing is true. Now, if the opposite is true, if the negation is true, then the original statement, sorry, look, if this is wrong, that the negation is true, the negation must be false, which means that the original statement must be true. Does that make sense? Sometimes it's just the hearing true and then saying, but it's not true, so it's false, which means that the other thing is true. It just gets confusing. Yes. It will make more sense when we see it with an example, OK? So the weirdest thing at the beginning of these is we assume that the opposite is true. We then show that that is complete nonsense, which makes us then think that the original statement was actually true. So here we're going to assume. <laughs> let's, go, let's go in with this question and we'll see how it goes. Exactly. So for this one, it says, prove there is no greatest odd integer. Well, that's not true. We know that there, we know there is, sorry, this is true. There is a great, there is no greatest odd integer. You can always make an integer bigger than that. So what we'll do is we say for contradiction, and the reason we say for contradiction at the beginning is to tell the examiner that we've not gone completely crazy when we write this next bit. We are going to assume there is a greatest odd integer. And I might call that greatest odd integer n. I don't care what we call it. Just assume that there is one. So the reason I've said four contradictions, because if I started this off and I said, assume that there is a greatest odd integer, you'd kind of feel like you've gone a bit mad, because we know there isn't a greatest odd integer. Then what we would say is we're going to try and do something to make it go wrong. But n plus 2 is also odd and greater than n. Hence, a contradiction. And when I'm saying a contradiction here, I'm, I'm saying that our assumption is wrong. So our contradiction has been created this thing that has gone wrong. So hence, we have a contradiction. And our assumption is wrong. So there is no greatest odd integer. Yes. 
So lots of the time they will say prove by contradiction. Um, some of the times they won't. Because there's often like options of different things you can try for proof. But usually they will flag post it by saying like prove by contradiction. Here they didn't. But I, I think this seems like the only way of doing it. So, yeah, you have to make this assumption, this contradiction assum assumption, so that you can then trash it and say, well, the thing that I was trying to prove was true is completely false, so the opposite of that must be true. So you wouldn't have to write that if they say prove by contradiction? Yes, you would. You would start off every, quest every question, you will make an assumption that the negation of the statement is true, the opposite of the statement is true, and then you will do some maths to show that something goes wrong, and then that proves that the opposite of the original statement, the opposite of the assumption, is then true. So I'll just give you a few more seconds to write that down. It will, usually this kind of is weird to begin with, and then the more of them you do, you start noticing what happens here. So just to go through these points, first of all, we assumed it was false. In other words, that there was an opposite. We then did some maths that created a contradiction. We added two, and so we were wrong in our assumption, which means that actually the statement was true. I'm going to do a couple more of these. In fact, a few more of these. It's a bit more of like a lectury kind of lesson today, because I need you to just see lots of them, and then you can practice lots of them. Can I go on to the next one? So we're going to prove by contradiction that if n squared is even, then n must be even. So first of all, we need to assume the opposite of that, the negation of that. And I've written here the negation of if A, then B. So in this case, if N squared is even, then B must be even. The opposite of that is if A, then not B. So what do you think our contradiction is going to be? Good. So we're going to assume for contradiction... that if n squared is even, then n is odd. Notice how we flipped it from n being even to n being odd. No, we're, we're proving this statement is true. If n squared is an even number, then n must be even. Think of a... a, a Yeah. Yeah, and they're both even numbers, so it works. So we're we're proving this is right because this is true. If you think of like I don't know 64, then the square root of 64 is eight, so it's true that if n squared is even, n is even. What we're going to do is we're going to assume that the opposite is true. We're going to assume instead that if n squared is even, n is odd, which is crazy because we know that the square root of even numbers is even numbers. So we're going to use this information to then show that that makes no sense, which means that the original statement is the one that does make sense. So here, as n is odd, n is equal to 2k plus 1, where k is an integer. So then I'm going to work out what n squared is. And we want, if this contradiction, if this weird thing that we were assuming was true, then n squared would be even. So n squared would be 2k plus 1 squared, which is 4k squared plus 2k, so plus 4k plus 1, which is 2 lots of 2k squared plus 2k plus 1 which is odd. But remember, we said that n squared was even. So we have a contradiction. We've had something go wrong here. But our assumption said n squared was even. So we have a contradiction. Hence, 
if n squared is even, then n must be even. So we were always trying to prove the statement that's given to us. It's all that, that thing they ask you to prove is true. If n squared is even, n must be even. We do something weird. We flip it on its head and we pretend that the opposite reality is true. We show that that opposite reality doesn't work with what they, they did. And because the opposite reality is wrong, that means the true reality must be right of that statement. So it's weird. Instead of trying to prove that something is true, we prove that the opposite is false, which means that it's true. So you know when you, you make the whole chain of analysis for so many three, you're saying those three dots instead of that four? Yeah, you could do those three dots instead of that four. Yeah. OK, we're just going to keep going and trying a few more of these. Is that OK? I'll give you a chance to finish writing some of these bits down. Um, so I'm just going to write this whilst we're talking. If you have your statement and then the negation, we assume that the negation is true, but then in fact we find out that it's false. So because it's false, that must mean that the statement is true because the statement and the negation are the opposite of each other. So that's really what's happening there. We're starting off by saying, let's pretend that the opposite is true. Well, it's not true, it's false. That must mean that the original statement is true because the original statement and the negation, negation means opposite, okay? So that's why this is actually working in this way. I'm gonna go on to the next one. You can always write these up later. So this one says, use proof by contradiction to show that there exist no integers a and b for which 25a plus 15b equals one. Well, let's just try and even think about what this problem is before we even do a proof by contradiction. I'm gonna do a different kind of one. If I had something like, instead, you don't need to write this bit down. Let's say I had like 2a plus 3b, and I wanted to see if I could make that to equal one. Could I find integers that would make that work for a and b? Yeah. What could a be? A could be, yeah? A could be two and b could be, and b could be minus one. So that is an example where this does have integers that could make it true, okay? But the one we're trying to talk about is 25a plus 15b being equal to one. And you can try and think of a value of a and a value of b that when you multiply it by 25 and you multiply b by 15, obviously one of them would need to be negative. We wanna see if we can make it equal one, but I don't think we're gonna be able to do it because we know we're trying to prove that that is true. This one, we could find values. So it's, it is possible. This one, it's not going to be possible. Well, if you're substituting in, then I don't know. No, you can't do substitutions because you would have to try out every integer that exists yeah. to be able to show that it worked. So it's a proof. So we've got to try absolutely everything. So what's our contradiction going to be? We're going to assume, what's the opposite of that statement? Right. Yeah, OK, so we're going to assume for contradiction you don't need to put this for contradiction, but I just like to tell the examiner that we're doing a contradiction. So we're going to assume that there are integers a and b such that 25a plus 15b is equal to 1. So we have done the assumption step. The next step is to try and do what? What did we say the next step is to try and do? Prove to prove that this is nonsense. OK, I'm going to prove this is nonsense. Has anyone got any ideas of what I can do with this statement here? When you look at 25 and 15, what does your brain think when you see 25 and 15? Factorize, or that they're both multiples of five. So I'm going to do something with that. My brain says, these are both in the five times table. So I'm going to divide everything by five and see what happens. If I divide this by five, if I divide this by five, if I divide this by five. Now we want something to break or go wrong. What has broken or gone wrong here if we have assumed that there are integers a and b such that this is true? 
You can't have two integers being multiplied by integers to give you a non-integer. Does that make sense? Yeah? You can't think of any integers that when you times them by 3 and 5 and add them together that you would ever get a fraction. So uh, we have a contradiction. Because integers multiplied by integers and added can't equal a fraction. Hence, there are no integers. A and B, such that 25A plus 15B is equal to 1. So just going back to what um, Saria said, she was like, oh, well, couldn't we just try out numbers? And I, I know she's realized why that can't be done. But this is a proof that convinces me that there are no integers for it because there are no integers that would make this true and it's the same statement. So if there's no integers that would make this true, but we had to pretend that we could do it in order to make it break. It's a very, very strange sort of idea to do this, but the more you do, it will make um, some more sense here. Yeah, you could say that. You could say that. I just want to be formal. If you're going to be doing this as like at maths for the university, you would write the whole thing. If you're trying to save time, you can say, assume the statement is true. I don't know about the marks for it. We're going to, I always prefer to write more rather than less. 